my friends and I always text blaze it at 420. So I just have to say blaze it real quick. Blaze it. Okay. I sent my blaze it text. I got my friend points for the day. Back to the podcast. Welcome to Wild True, the podcast of your wildest memes. We're your one-stop internet culture shop here to dissect what's going viral, why we care, and how this might affect our real human lives. I'm memes, Isabel. <laughs> and I'm Amanda. Anyone can be famous on the internet, so why not us? Um, Isabel's currently stuck in the Omelas hole. Don't kill her. But instead, we have Organizer Memes here today. Hello, Organizer Memes. I'm back. It's been like three years since you've been on the podcast, which I can't believe we've even had a podcast for three years. I can't believe I've been making memes and pissing off weirdos for that long, too. Like, I, th- I truly did not think that this was going to be what I was still doing now. I mean, I'm, I'm glad it's worked out because it's cool that your job is making memes and, as you say, pissing off weirdos. But I didn't know your actual name last time we recorded, and now it is three years later. We have hung out in person. We're buds. Here we are. Yeah, so a lot of character development. And also, like, then I wasn't, <laughs> like, working as a meme maker like this. Like... Yeah, tell us about, like, your actual, like, what is your job now? (laughs) Yeah, so I, like, freelance meme consult full-time, or full enough time that, like, I'm being paid more than I was being paid back then, for sure, to do a lot (laughs) less hours and a lot more fun work. Um, But, yeah, basically, kind of the three main pillars of influencer work that I do these days is, like, digital strategy, so I just kind of tell people how to connect to young people and how to fix their digital. Uh, I do these meme trainings where I teach people literally how to make memes, uh, which was on NPR recently, which, whoa. And then the third is kind of making literal content for people and then posting that either for them or for me. It's so interesting, too, just like comparing to our last conversation when I feel like, wow, it's been three years now, so I don't know if people who didn't listen to early episodes know this, but I know about organizer memes because in 2020 I was working as an organizer. And uh, it's a job that can simultaneously be very rewarding when you, like, can, like, literally just, like, change whether or not someone votes. Like, I think especially in 2020, so much of my job, for me at least, was, like, do you understand how to get a mail-in ballot? Do you understand how to fill in the mail-in ballot? Do you understand how to find where to drop it off? And, like, the the naked ballots, that was a whole thing. (laughs) I haven't even thought about naked ballots in four years. I know. So it's like half of it is like, wow, someone is going to vote because I talked to them. And then half of it is like, I am being screamed at by a redneck from Western PA who one time I was phone banking and someone was like, where did you go to school? And I was like, I went to Penn. And he was like, and now you're doing this? Damn. Hey, I mean, telling people I make memes for a living... I get similar responses. I mean, if we're thinking about just like how things have changed, we are in such a different world than we were then, both in terms of like personally for both of us, but also like the way memes are viewed as like an agent of change and like how well they're received by real people that have real jobs. Yeah. And even now that like the Biden reelection campaign is in full swing, they've been leaning very heavily on memes. Like they're, they're kind of obsessed with the dark Brandon meme, which I find very weird because that's a meme that is like three conspiracy theories in a trench coat. Like it's a meme that is born out of various right wing conspiracy theories and then like adopted by the Biden campaign. And then now they sell merch and that's like the majority of the merch they sell is dark Brandon merch, which I also am surprised by that because I feel like People that aren't on the internet don't know what that means, and a lot of voters aren't on the internet. Yeah, and also, you know, merch is, I think, a younger person's thing a lot of the time anyway, so I think it it kind of makes sense. And not to shamelessly promo, but if you want 15% off on the Biden campaign website for merch, uh, put in memes work uh, in the promo code, uh, because memes work. Um, Oh my god. (laughs) Yeah, like, I mean, that's the thing, that, that, right? Like, that is wild. The fact that... You have a promo code on the Biden game. That's so yeah, funny. Yeah, I couldn't get anyone in 2020 to take memes seriously at all. 
Like, I was like, yeah. hey, I have all these memes about what's going on. Please, someone use them. And, like, nobody but Marky was, like, interested basically at all. And a couple other, like, small people. But, like, if you were to tell me that, like, the people that, like, hated me for making memes four years ago... And not, like, the, the Biden campaign as a general hated me. But, like, there was no chance that that was going to happen last last election. Um, also, one of the things you said was, you know, they've really leaned into memes. No, they've really leaned in... Really, they've leaned into meme, right? Like, <laughs> they've really leaned into the dark Brandon thing. And pretty much nothing else. And, like, I would love it if they were like, hey, we have ten memes that we love. But it must be polling just incredibly well on on, like, their, like... Because they don't make these kinds of decisions without testing and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, like, obviously somewhere they're like, oh, this, this is the secret sauce to, like, engagement bait or something. Yeah, it, which it's, it's wild to imagine, like, even though I know this is true, but, like, a room of high-ranking, like, Biden organizers being like, okay, so here's what people are saying about Dark Brandon. Yeah, the meme, like, imagine being the staffer that has to explain Dark Brandon to Biden. Like, <laughs> so true. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, I would love to have seen how that was pitched. Yeah. And then he's on TikTok now. He's out here, like, making TikToks, which is also very interesting considering that, like, TikTok is not allowed on congressional staffers' phones. But I think the reason why that's okay is because the people that are working on the campaign are separate from, like, Biden staff. Also, like, they can do it on their personal phone, I guess. <laughs> like, it's it's so weird. As someone who has helped people know how to do safety on campaigns using TikTok, I am certain, although I have no, like, specific knowledge about Biden's, like, campaign safety stuff, but, like, I would be shocked if the phone that they're using isn't, like, literally blank except for TikTok. Yeah. You don't want another situation like when um, famously there was an intern, I guess we're assuming, we don't know, on Ted Cruz's Twitter, and then they liked a porn video on Twitter and it came up under Ted Cruz's likes. Not just a porn video, an incest porn (laughs) video. Um, Which is important Uh... for me to clarify for... Yes. The internet historians out there. Yes, for fact checking. It wasn't just porn, it was insect. Yeah. In- not insect, incest porn. Insect that porn. That I would could be have worked like, with. Yeah. In, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, do you know love bugs? I don't want to even know what that. Oh, no, they're just means. literally a type of bug. We had them, like, oh. in my elementary school. They're, like, they were on our playground and they're just bugs that are called love bugs because they're, like, I believe they are having sex in the air, or maybe that's just what people were saying at recess in elementary school. I will have to fact check this for the internet historians. But the reason why we have you here today is because um, we want to unpack your recent beef. Um, Which presidential candidate have you been having beef with? Yeah, um, the Orb mother herself, Marianne Williamson, and I have been having... A truly interesting month-ish. Yeah, well, I guess for our non-American listeners, because we're an international podcast, she started out in, like, the 90s as sort of, like, a non-profit founder, but I think she was, like, independently wealthy, and then also was, like, writing these wild books, which um, the podcast Maintenance Phase did an episode about her because she wrote a diet book, which is insane. And I was listening to that this morning because I was preparing to talk about her. But, like, she wrote books that are, like, if you, like, losing weight brings you closer to God. It's crazy. She's, like, BFFs with Oprah, weirdly. Although so is Dr. Oz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a great track record. Oprah has some some sketchy friends. But, yeah, but she went from, like, self-help guru to uh, just being one of those guys who just keeps running for president. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so 2020 ran, did horribly. 2024 ran in a much smaller race against Biden as the incumbent um, and did about as horribly. I mean, maybe a couple percent. I mean, I think got 3% in New Hampshire when Biden wasn't on the ballot. 
and since that has only gone down. Uh, I, I, one of the jokes I made that was that like Dean Phillips and her are literally like getting milk percentages. <laughs> but so here's the thing: I don't like Marianne Williamson for a lot of reasons. I didn't like her last time she ran. I don't like her this time that she ran. And it's not even policy, which is so annoying. I would love a lefty progressive to have kind of joined the race early, been serious, done something interesting. I mean, it would have been a career suicide move, which is why people didn't. But Marianne doesn't have a real career in politics. She just has grifters around her and like people that she can you know, get money out of on, that support her. And truly, I think, an ego the size of the United States. But kind of where my interactions with her started is a little clarification. If you didn't watch the last podcast about me, you should, though. I ha- I'm friends, and I kind of anonymously share the, the gossip of just political organizers online. You're organizer gossip girl. Yes. Mixed with, like, I don't know, a little bit of more, like, white hat hacking. <laughs> but... I got messages from several people that I'm friends with or friend, internet friends with, as so many of us are, uh, with a bunch of people that worked and then quit or were fired from the Marion Williamson campaign, talking about just how horrible it was to work for her. And so I posted, you know, threads upon threads. I guess they're all, like, in group chats and stuff that where they, like, shit talk Marianne because they've all, like, were in the cult kind of and the kind of had a realization and the stuff that they like allege is horrifying like kicking staff members under the table during like meetings with volunteers to the point where like the person like winced in pain or screaming at people micromanaging just like all the horrible things that like you pretty much you can do as a boss you know not allowing for any days off just not being the progressive woo woo love will heal the world person that you know she kind of portrays herself for so I started posting that, and so I kind of like had one of her like main like Twitter people fighting back and forth with me, and then from the same sources that I kind of already used to post stuff, and so I use sources very loosely. I'm not a journalist, uh, unlike some people. <laughs> um, but I get a message saying Marianne is about to drop out. She cleared her schedule. She has like a unexpected meeting with her volunteers tonight. Like, her campaign manager for that, like, joined to win her New Hampshire or, like, get her to a good percent dropped out while they were still literally counting votes and, like, resigned from the campaign mm. and supposedly, like, wasn't paid and stuff. Although that might have been a different campaign manager. Marianne also went through, like, five campaign managers this election. Maybe that's one more than true. But, like, if you work in politics, it's a primary that hasn't started yet. <laughs> Well, according to uh, the maintenance phase episode that I listened to this morning, at one of her nonprofits, they had five executive directors in four years. So, you know, yeah. great. But basically, I get sent a lot of things that would point towards her dropping out of the race after New Hampshire, which would make sense because she came in so poorly. And basically, everyone that was on her team was like, no, you're lying, you're lying, she's not dropping out. I get sent a Zoom link. I share the Zoom link two hours before the Zoom. So there's like a hundred people extra on this Zoom who are my people who are, some of them are trolling in the comments. I didn't do any trolling in the comments because I thought that, like, I was trying to just be an observer and maybe break a story. And that's the other thing, sorry. No one from the media gave a shit. Um, Like, I was like trying to like connect people to be like, hey, like, I think she's about to drop out. Like, this is a story. Not you, um, because it's not your beat. But like... The pe- I have friends that are, po- that are like, political journalists, and I was like, hey, this is, like, a, a big thing. Poten- I mean, not that big, but, like, we've paid a lot. She's going to get more delegates than um, Ron DeSantis, and we play- paid so much attention to him. I know it's, like, a less competitive primary or something, but it's really not. But basically, I get on the thing, and she basically starts saying, like, you know, if we'd gotten 15% instead of 3% in New Hampshire, things would look different. But we don't have have the money to go on to other states. We're not going to South Carolina because, you know, we're not going to win in South Carolina, which basically just means that she's doing bad with black voters, by the way. Mm. And then she was like, and, you know, we don't have the money for Nevada, which was where they were going to go. 
And so then on the line with her people, she says, so it seems like the power move right now is to drop out of the race. And to me, that said, I'm dropping out of the race because that's what she just said. And basically, at that point, or a little bit afterwards, she gets a text from her people. And my stuff is blowing up. Um, People, you know, are starting to, like, quote tweet and news sources are starting to, like, pick up on it and say that she's dropped out. She gets a text message during the thing, and she reads it out loud, That and she's like, someone is tweeting out the Zoom link. <laughs> but she was like, that's not good. And also, when she told everyone that she was dropping out, she was like, and I don't want the media to know this. And I was like, well, then you shouldn't have had a public Zoom event. But then she announced that she was dropping out, and everyone in her thing started arguing with her. Like, they interrupted her speech, her, like, I'm dropping out speech, to be like, don't do it. And I could literally see, like, people crying. Like, it was a really, like, emotional moment. And I literally saw Marianne changing her mind in real time. That's so weird. Basically, like, backtracking and being like... And someone was like, well, we could just run a a completely online campaign. We don't need money for that. And, like, we could just, like, do TikToks all the time, which is what she ended up doing for, like, a week. Because after the thing, she was like, oh, we're shutting down the the meeting because, as someone called me, a saboteur was involved. Oh, my God. That's... Being called a saboteur was very funny. Um, (laughs) And people were, like, people were furious at me on the call. But also, like, sorry. But then she gets off. She, like, ends the meeting. I end up getting kicked off, like, towards the very end. So I actually don't know what happened at the very end of the meeting. But she then posts on her Twitter... Like, anything, anyone saying that, like, I dropped out is wrong. Don't believe anything that you heard unless I say it to you. And so then I posted, because one of my friends screen recorded the whole thing, the clip of her saying that the power move would be to drop out at this point. And she did not like that at all and blocked me. But then I also received a message, and this is the thing. People are like, it's memes versus Marianne Williamson. Like, that's not really true. It's like, all my friends. I couldn't have done this without so many people. I mean, people were DMing me tips the entire time. But the la- this next tip, she had, I guess, already, like, made a video and made, like... She had made all the infrastructure for her to drop out. So I guess she had posted. Um, so it was made but never shared out where she basically said, Today I, like, it, the quote was like, Today I dropped out or suspended my campaign, but I still need money to cover campaign costs. And I was like, huh, so you weren't ever planning on dropping out, but you have this open up. And she literally replied to me. Like, before that, she was just, like, kind of vague tweeting about, like, you know, Mm -hmm. other campaigns sent people, which, for the record, this was just all for the love of the game. This was not (laughs) me, like, working for Biden or something. Mm -hmm. Although, like, if they'd asked me to, I probably would have, but, like, this wasn't even, like, truly that I think that she, like, is selling pseudoscience and, like, anti-vax stuff. This was truly, like, you fucked with my friends and they keep bringing up, like, this crazy story. But so me posting the Act Blue link with her saying that she was dropping out and, like, that she had already dropped out, she then replied to that and said that it was hacked misinformation, which she then promptly deleted um, once she realized that it was publicly available on her website or on her Act Blue website. I love, like, when people say that things on the internet were hacked when they're, like, publicly available. (laughs) Yeah. Like, no hacking was involved. (laughs) But then she dropped out, like, a week after all that. And one of the things that I think was funny is that her whole thing was that she was dropping out early because she said, like, the way that you drop out is how people remember you. And I hope that this is how people remember her. And then... A couple days ago, she posted that she's considering to undrop out (laughs) and continue campaigning, which I just think is an incredible kind of development. But, like, her people supposedly are furious at me and, like, are screening my tweets and stuff now. Even though, like, they don't, like, it's not a campaign anymore, but they're focusing on a meme page. Hey, and if that doesn't show you that memes matter, then I don't know what does. Yeah, memes matter. 15% off on the Biden merch website. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the other thing that was truly wild was, like, the lack of campaign discipline. Like, the reason I knew so much, the reason I had Zoom links to, like, all these different events that they I kept just showing up at, and they, they kept, like, canceling events and stuff because I'd show up to them. But, like, the reason I had that was, like, they had fired people and kept them in the volunteer Zoom. Uh, volunteer <laughs> Slack, sorry. And then, like, 
they didn't have any like monitoring of the sla- of the like the zoom chat so like when my people were like trolling they weren't aware for a while and also like they didn't have us muted i truly could have like halfway through her like being like i'm thinking of dropping up and like orb 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 like i was trying to think of something <laughs> to like you know kind of heckle her but like her own people ended up heckling her because they didn't have any like permissions set this is and just like shit. yeah i mean I've seen like you know I've I've seen hundred person temples that have understood how to do a Zoom call. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, she's running a presidential campaign. Yeah. And you could see also. Sorry, I'm kind of all over the place just because so much, so many things happened. But you could kind of mm-hmm. see like the things that people have said about her, like the way she talked to staff, and like at the very beginning of the call, someone had, was like, "We have a, a an Instagram supporter with two million followers." Like, how can I direct them to someone? And she, like, snapped at her person being like, why didn't you send that to me? And the person was like, I did twice. And I was like, damn, like, that's on, like, a volunteer open face Zoom. It's just, it's been so wacky. She doesn't seem to be embodying the principles outlined in her 1992 bestseller, A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. Yeah, it'd be a miracle if she won. Yeah, just a truly weird moment that i here's the thing i post about a lot of people all the time like i'm not shy from like i don't shy away from conflict especially when like people are giving me juicy and on tea but like people don't respond but the other thing that i don't understand is like no one cared like my followers loved it it did well on the internet and like this is literally like the closest to me like talking to a journalist that has happened by it <laughs> And I'm just, like, confused because, like, this is a great story. And, like, I didn't even tell it that well to you just now. It's weird how, and we talked a little bit about this three years ago now, but, like, this stuff is being covered now by just a lot of amateurs, right? And, like, for good and bad. But, like, I don't know. I feel like someone else should have had that, like, my sources. Yeah, I mean, I think... My cynical guess is that there's just so few journalists left. And it's crazy because we're heading into an election year, which you would think that, like, the New York Times and shit would be hiring crazy amounts of, like, DC reporters. But it just, it feels like I've been joking to my friends that I'm the last remaining journalist. But, like, I wouldn't necessarily be able to pick up a story like that because, like, what's the tech angle? What's the, like, and I have to do that for work. You could argue that the tech angle is, like, meme page interfering with Zoom, but I just, I don't think my editors would agree, even though I think that's an angle. But it's a great story for Wow of True, the podcast of your wildest memes. No, but, like, that's what I'm saying is, like, as tech, and I've been thinking a lot about, like, media and tech layoff, stuff as i'm i I mean i see your tweets you are too (laughs) but like the role of accounts like mine and i don't try and like i'm not that important of a person right like i'm not i didn't take a journalism degree i'm literally just a meme page but like if we don't have journalists like amateur crowdsourced journalism seems like one way things are going to happen and i wish that like that wasn't the case, but I don't know. I do think that there are good examples of that happening. Like, there's, like, YouTubers that do excellent original reporting. There's TikTokers that do that. I just worry that something will go wrong because you have people that aren't... Like, there's no, like, organizer memes editorial standards that you're, like, referring to necessarily. Which I think that you're smart enough and... Just my own. Yeah. But yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, like, I I think, like, being smart and conscientious goes a long way. But, like, I get into situations all the time where I'm like, if I was reporting on behalf of Amanda Silberling, I would say this. But on behalf of this outlet, I can't get them in legal trouble. Like, there was something yesterday with um, Matt Mullenweg tweeting insane things. He's the CEO of Tumblr at someone who got banned from Tumblr. And then one of the tweets got deleted. And 
I individually felt like there was enough evidence to report that the deleted tweet existed. But since I wasn't 100% sure, I'm like, I could get sued if I say that. And it turns out to be like a hoax. But I was able to find something else that kind of verified it anyway. But like, sometimes journalism standards get in the way. And sometimes, like, I don't know. I have mixed feelings. Because I do think that like democratizing journalism and having voices that aren't able to like be in traditional media is important. But I also worry about like, when is that going to cause a big blow up? I mean, the thing is, and I totally agree with you. I think that there's, with every development in tech and the world, there's pros and cons. Maybe not the fact that there are no journalists left. That's probably a (laughs) pretty big, obvious con. But like, you're not supposed to like reveal sources, right? There's no contractual obligation. There's no even, like, ethical obligation, I think, for me to be keeping my nons and nons. I'm going to do it, don't get me wrong. Because, and that's part of it, right? Is, like, the reason people send it to me is they trust that they can come to me. And I also think it's interesting that, like, the public has lost trust in the media, which I think is not, it's not not our fault. And I do think it's interesting that people feel more comfortable coming to a meme page than to, like, a Politico reporter. Also, I think, like, I've talked to people who trust coming to me to not share their identity more than, like, going to establishment and, like, well, highly regarded political journalist groups. Mm -hmm. Because, like, their bosses have had so many good puff pieces and have relationships with all these papers. Yeah, I wonder if that's different in politics. I mean, I'm sure, though, there's people that are, you know, in tech journalism that are friendly with Elon that lowly Twitter employees aren't going to be sources to these days. Yeah, I mean, there is a publication I know of that the editor-in-chief is close personal friends with Mark Zuckerberg, like, literally. And I feel weird about that, but also that publication does critically cover meta still. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't know if you can ethically be the editor of a tech paper and be BFFs with Mark Zuckerberg. And like, I mean, I have this as an issue, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I get anons about candidates I want to win. Yeah. And like, I'm going to be honest... I've definitely caught and killed for candidates Mm -hmm. that people on this podcast know and love, and it probably has helped us keep the Senate, (laughs) right? Like, Yeah, well, I mean, hey, uh, in in Pennsylvania, we have a senator that I was once very excited about and I'm now very frustrated with, so... (laughs) Hey, that's not fair to... uh, Fuck, I forget the other guy's name. Um, Um, Bob Casey. (laughs) Bob Casey, yeah. Um, No, I mean, like, there were some DMs from maybe that campaign that if I had leaked in, you know, early 2022, I don't think we would be in the same place we are on a couple different of the Senate races. And, like, okay, if I was a journalist, like, yum, yum, yum. But as, like, a person that is primarily a political operative who just kind of exposes shit on a meme page, I'm like, do I have a responsibility to share this? I don't know. It it gets very complicated very quickly, which is why I reach out to you as much as I do. (laughs) Because I'm not trained as a journalist. And, like, I don't know. I mean, also, like, I'm a meme page. I should be allowed to make jokes that aren't true. Yeah, I mean, I think the good thing about these sort of alternative journalism sources, I'll call it, is, like, If I were a political journalist and someone told me, like, Bernie Sanders did this terrible thing, I couldn't ethically, like, it would feel ethically gross to be like, I'm not going to touch that. But as a meme page, you do have a political agenda on the meme page. I don't think it's unethical for you to pick and choose, like, not to post things about candidates that are in close races that can decide the Senate. The other thing is, like, I tell I, t- I think I did say this on your pay- on your podcast literally three years ago, and I still mean it. Like I should not be the person that you go to in these situations. Like there needs to be a system. Yeah. Like there needs to be democratic HR that works. <laughs> yeah. Well, campaign HR probably is more protecting the candidate than the people. Hey. 
Yeah, but like I mean, like 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 industry wide, we need some form of accountability measure. Is kind of more what I'm saying, and the fact that like yeah. I've become that is because there is a huge gap in our place where like there's nowhere to talk to other people that work in the same field as you, except unless you like go to conferences, which is expensive and like time consuming and inaccessible. But like. I don't know. It was supposed to be a meme page. This is this was never supposed to be a, a journalistic endeavor. This was never supposed to be a group therapy session. With great power comes great memes. With great memes comes great responsibility. I think is more the oh yeah 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 the yeah. lesson. Um, but also like I'm so grateful. Like I I hope that like that doesn't like the fact that I am probably one of the only people in this industry that's able to like be a full time meme maker. And, like, people are starting to actually listen is, like, an amazing opportunity. Yeah, and it's crazy that, like, you're, like, you're doing meme trainings. Like, that's your, like, you're teaching people how to make memes. And, like, making meme trainings for, like, big, uh, I mean, I was in North Carolina for an in-person event with a panda head on. And they introduced the governor and the attorney general to speak. And then ten minutes later, I was on in, a like, a furry style, like, panda mask. <laughs> Talking about like the importance of shit posting, and like yeah, I just did it. Like you know, I've trained literally like congressional people, and like congressional offices and stuff, and maybe some big things coming up soon. Stay tuned, that I can't NDA wise talk about. Um, but like I don't know. It's it's getting like you've you've believed in me. Like I like I don't know. Like you you saw what meme. Like you understand the internet. Yeah, I was out here in 2020 suffering on a campaign and being like, organizer memes, and then people thought I was organizer memes, and I was like, organizer memes has existed since before I worked on a campaign, this is not me. (laughs) But like, I've met with people like, in like, serious like, business meetings, and we're talking about, like, at very high levels, and we're talking about like, you know, whether we should put Trump's face on a on like a Drake meme, I don't know. It, it's just it's become such a different world, and also TikTok has just become huge. Yeah, and especially the the way that TikTok has been politicized as it is lit- literally a political issue where you have these senators like screaming at the CEO in hearings and being like crazy racist towards him. Like it's it's insane. Like. Senators literally don't know that China and Singapore are two different countries. Jesus. Well, thanks for being on the show, and I know you have to run, so let's make this a quick plug. <laughs> yeah, uh, Organizer Memes was brought to you by organizers like you. Uh, we are, exist on X slash Twitter at organizermemes.twitter or twitter.organizermemes or whatever, how you just say that. Uh, but also, <laughs> our link tree has all the different places because Elon is a fascist. Uh, love you, miss you. Bye! Bye. And we're back. Isabel is still stuck in the Omelas hole. So uh, I'm just going to talk about some things that happened on the internet this week. Uh, the two big stories are uh, Reddit IPO and uh, Matt Mullenweg Tumblr Breakdown. Let's start with Matt Mullenweg Tumblr Breakdown. Matt Mullenweg is the CEO of Automatic, which is the company that owns Tumblr. It also owns like WordPress.org. And he's owned Tumblr since like 2019 when TBT to when Yahoo bought Tumblr in 2013 for $1 billion. And then in six years later in 2019, they sold it for 3 million. So now Automatic owns it. Tumblr's just been in the shitter lately. I mean, it's kind of been falling apart for a while because, you know, uh, Tumblr. But last year, Matt Mullenweg said that the platform loses $30 million each year. And at the end of last year, he reassigned basically all staff except for like very essential people to other projects within Automatic because he just did not want to invest in Tumblr anymore. It just was not making money. Kind of understandable because Tumblr users like don't want to give Tumblr money except to buy crabs, which um, weird, you know, normal business doesn't apply in Tumblr land. But Basically what happened was there was a user named Predstrogen who is a trans woman and had been 
dealing with trans misogyny on the platform. She was very frustrated because Tumblr wasn't taking her reports of harassment seriously. Instead, she was having a lot of consequences directed at her account. There were things like adult content flags that she thought were not. Like Tumblr now allows certain kinds of adult content if you tag it in the right way. And then they were saying she like mistagged it. The details of that aren't super interesting. Like people get banned on social media platforms for stupid reasons all the time, whether, I mean, that's a bad thing, but that just, that does happen all the time. But what's weird is that Matt Mullenweg himself weighed in on the case of this one moderation issue. CEOs don't normally weigh in on individual content moderation issues. Like, that's insane. Except, like, Elon Musk does, but he also has secret babies. I don't know what to tell you. So he starts just, like, answering asks, and he says... We generally do not comment on individual cases, but because there seems to be mass misinformation around this, I will make an exception and comment on predstrogen. And then he goes like, I have gay friends. I can't be anti-gay. Like, I met a trans person once. We have gender-neutral bathrooms in the New York office. Like, cool. Basically, the reason why he said she was banned was because she, in her frustration, posted that she hopes that he, quote, dies a forever painful death involving a car covered in hammers that explodes more than a few times and hammers go flying everywhere. I think this is really interesting of what constitutes a death threat. Matt Mullenweg said that's a death threat. But then there was another case on Blue Sky last year, back when the platform still had like less than 100,000 users, like closed beta, like very small, which is why they like talked about this more publicly, I believe. But there was a black user who someone told her that they wanted her to, quote, get shoved off somewhere real high. And Blue Sky was like, that is like violent imagery that came up from venting and not a legitimate death threat. Jay Graber, the CEO, wrote, wisely or not, many people use violent imagery when they're arguing or venting. We debated whether a death threat needs to be specific and direct in order to cause harm, and what it would mean for people's ability to engage in heated discussions on Blue Sky if we prohibited this kind of speech. And I just thought that was really interesting, the juxtaposition of these two things, because here you have Blue Sky saying that getting shoved off somewhere real high is not a death threat. And then on Tumblr, you have someone saying a forever painful death involving a car covered in hammers that explodes more than a few times and hammer goes flying everywhere. And that is a death threat, which like, I don't know. I mean, if somebody said the dies a forever painful death, yada, yada thing about me, I would be nervous. I do think like maybe she shouldn't have said that, but I think the consequences of her saying that have been absolutely insane. So not only has Matt Mullenweg just been publicly talking about this decision on his blog, he also has gone as far as to like reveal her different account names because like normal people on Tumblr, she hoarded like a billion URLs. And oh man, I need to quote this directly. Oh man, I wrote about this yesterday and it's literally still up. I can't believe they still have this online. This isn't even the whole one. There was a tweet that got deleted, but I couldn't verify that it was real. So I didn't like report it just because I was like, I don't want to get sued. But this is still on the blog where he says, on the adult content mistagging, I added context to say it has nothing to do with the clothed transition photos. Um, There was like something where they thought it might've had to do with like her posting about her transition. She had 20 plus other blogs with multiple accounts with names so explicit I can't post them here without a mature tag, including some like Irish Big Cock Girl, Hung Queen, Cum Spangler, Girl Taint, and 16 plus more. But like on her actual account, I need to go find this also. Oh man, he, he's still posting through it. Like, dude, I'm surprised the stuff is still online. Okay, so here's the one where, to be clear, like, I, Amanda, think this is real. I, Amanda, the journalist, did not have enough information to report this as fact, so take that with a grain of salt. But this is the supposed deleted tweet. 
When will you be honest with your followers that the repeated adult content violations were not pictures like this, it's a response to her posting selfies, but likely ones on your other accounts, parentheses, actual names. Irish big cock girl, burger foot job, furry vor burps, breadstrogen, cum burp, dog girl ball sack, hung queen, big titty cock gf, big cock titty gf, girl taint, musk mommy, girl ball sack, Shower sharts, sapiosexual breeder, cat girl hairball, cat girl condom, cat girl cum sock, cat girl ball sack, cum spangler. So they didn't let me put that in the article also because I, I couldn't say Irish big cock girl on techcrunch.com. So that really happened. And yeah, I just cannot emphasize enough how unprecedented and unacceptable it is for a CEO to be engaging with an individual, an individual content moderation decision and the user it involves on other platforms. This was on Twitter. Like he followed her over to Twitter to like continue replying to her. And even though I can't verify the legitimacy of that one tweet, there was still other, like he responded to another tweet of hers. So It's just very inappropriate, and maybe in the Elon Musk era of owning Twitter, it seems more normal, but it's really not, and I don't know what's going to happen. He's supposed to be on sabbatical, but I feel like I wouldn't be surprised if he stepped down, because it seems like he's kind of losing his marbles. Uh, Moving on to, speaking of people losing their marbles, remember Wall Street Bets, TBT again, uh, to a very early Wow of True episode when Amanda McLaughlin came on to explain what shorting a stock means if it were Animal Crossing turnips? Really a a time capsule, a, a statement of the times. So Reddit is filing to go public. What that means is like, you are going to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange and then anybody in the public can buy stock in your company instead of just normally like investors can buy stock in it or like employees can have shares. But when you go public, it's like I could right now go and buy stock in Google, but I couldn't right now go buy stock in like what's a private company? Blue Sky, I guess. Uh, Speaking of Blue Sky. So In the filing that you have to submit to the government to become publicly listed on the stock exchange, you have to write out like a very comprehensive list of potential risks. And I just want to quote directly from this financial document, funniest thing I've ever seen in one of these documents, quote, Given the broad awareness and brand recognition of Reddit, including as a result of the popularity of r slash Wall Street bets among retail investors and the direct access by retail investors to broadly available trading platforms, the market price and trading volume of our Class A common stock could experience extreme volatility for reasons unrelated to our underlying business or macroeconomic or industry fundamentals, which could cause you to lose all or part of your investment if you are unable to sell your shares at above the initial offering price. Basically what that means is that because Wall Street Bets exists and it is a subreddit in a community based on Reddit where they like to short stocks and make meme stocks like GameStop, AMC, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, more on that in insert very early episode number here with Amanda McLaughlin, like they basically are just people that fuck with the stock market and what better stock to fuck with than literal Reddit stock? So I, I think it was a good move for Reddit to list that in the IPO that Wall Street Bets is a, is a risk. But it's very funny that like in other parts of the S1, which is the filing, they, they wrote out like, quote unquote, meme stocks. And I'm like, damn, meme stocks literally were in this filing. That's incredible. Another interesting thing about Reddit's IPO, though, I don't know if I said this, but IPO is, that just means when you go public. Like an interesting thing in their IPO is that they are offering for users to buy shares early. Like normally there is a thing called a directed share program. That's what it's called, which is like friends and family or employees or like institutional insiders get first dibs on buying a stock when it goes public. But 
if you have lots of karma on Reddit, people got invited to invest in the IPO. And there's like tiers based on like how much karma you have, you're earlier in line to invest in the IPO. And on one hand, I think it's really cool that Reddit is giving the people that made the company like worthwhile the ability to hopefully profit off of that. But I also, this isn't financial advice. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about when it comes to like finances, but it is really wild because I don't know how well the Reddit stock is going to do. Again, I, I don't know shit, but I mean, I know shit, but I don't know shit when it comes to like how stocks work. Like I, I'm not a financial analyst. You should only take advice from people that are like, it's their job to give you advice directly to you personally as an individual. Damn, I feel like Isabel right now. Isabel really is in the room. Hello, Isabel. But another risk factor is that Reddit has a deficit of 7.16.6 million. They've never made a profit. In the last year, they had a net loss of 90.8 million. So like, they're losing money. And... They have been making more money at the same time. One positive thing for the value of Reddit is that Reddit has been licensing its data to companies training AI models. And that's like 1 billion posts, 16 billion comments. I don't know if I would train a large language model on Reddit, but uh, people are doing it. And Reddit so far has made 203 million off of that, which that's really significant, especially considering, like, that's a big chunk of its debt. But I also worry about what it means for these large language models to be trained on Reddit because there's already so much bias in AI models because it's like, let's say, like, with Reddit as an example, I would say the majority of people posting on Reddit are probably, like, white men in their 20s and 30s. I could be totally wrong, but... If that's the case and you build a model around that data set, then you are going to have outputs that are built around the experiences of 20 to 30 year old white men. And actually there was an advertising company that made something called Are You Blacker Than Chat GPT? And it was sort of like a, a little quiz where it would ask a question and then you would have to choose an answer and then you would see what Chat GPT said. And then you have to find out if you are blacker than ChatGPT. Uh, yes, this was made by black people, and I'm not explaining it well, but it is on uh, the internet. But yeah, bias in AI is a thing that has existed, will continue to exist, and training on Reddit data, it's like, at best, you have a bunch of copy pastas of like, to be fair, you have to be relatively smart to understand Rick and Morty. And at worst, you have like, Wall Street bets bros who are, like, giving each other terrible financial advice on Reddit. I don't know. All right. Um, that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, actually, another thing we do want to share is we did make the portable hole mugs. If you go to wowtrue.com slash merch, you can buy a mug that says portable hole on it. And, you know, that's beautiful. I also didn't know that a portable hole is an object in D&D, or not an object, but a concept, because I just thought that was a thing Isabel made up that like, oh yeah, it's a hole that you can carry around. But then it came up in my D&D campaign of if you have a bag of holding and you put another bag of holding in it, a bag of holding being something that's like a bag that can hold infinite things, then it creates a wormhole and then it becomes a portable hole. So yeah, in the middle of our session, I was like, wait, Isabel didn't make that up. Hi, this is Iz, like, four days later, and here's just to say that Amanda's wrong about the portable hole again. A portable hole is an object in D&D, which is literally a round piece of silk that when you put it on the ground, that's a hole, baby. You can put things in it. It is literally, it's a Looney Tunes style portable hole. I'm recording this at 10, 12 the night before we're supposed to post, because someone on the internet was wrong, and that someone was Amanda. Also, thanks, Amanda, for recording the thing. I'm out. 
Anyway, I have to check on Isabel. I think I might have to go rescue her from the Omelas hole, but she can keep suffering for a little bit longer because I have to read the credits. If you liked this episode, tell a friend. Word of mouth is how we grow. Thank you to all of our patrons and shout out specifically to Zoe, Bray, Andromeda, Thea, Brian, Gabriel, Lada, Matt, Max, Isabel's sugar daddy Sam, Jock, and Aaron's husband. If you want your name in the above or in our Twitter header, slide right into our Patreon at patreon.com slash wowftrue. Shout out to audio editors, Allison Mills and David Newtown. Graphic designer and Canva warlock, Eric Silver, who made our logo. Sam Reiser, who made our podcast music. And Tessa Farrow, who is transcribing episodes. You can find us on Twitter as at wowftruepod and Instagram and Facebook as at wowftrue. Had your 15 seconds of internet fame? Slide right into our Twitter DMs and tell us about it. And until next time, let's rescue Isabel from the Omelas hole.